So, so committee, you do have a copy of the annual report inside your Manila file here. And if you want to pull out your iPads, you have a report, the house report. Okay. And I think I think there are extras on oh, the uh, housing report. Yeah. 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 So, um, me and, and some very smart staff, including, including Ashwin, um, so we, um, uh, we, we did some modeling of various um, uh, contingency plans uh, with respect to the housing bond or any other bond that would be requested and that would exceed to see that. Pretty much the same standards apply to that. I'm pretty sure these were the reports we've got targeted to eliminate. To eliminate what? Eliminate the report. We're targeting what we're doing. I'll call next week. Okay. If I stepped out for a minute. Well, that's why we only need eight minutes, right? We're not down to five. Yeah. Okay. Well, you've only got to sell four of us now because right. Senator Lyons is leaving. Yeah. Ah, we'll see you later. Yeah. I will be back. So, what would, what would you like? Uh, I can talk about debt in general. I can talk about the housing report. Especially for the benefit of uh, Senator Hooker, we probably ought to just back up a little step and go over the 50,000 foot view this time sure. instead of the 30,000 foot. Yep, okay. So um, I think that it would be helpful if, if you had the annual report starting on page 16, we've got a little bit of an overview of, uh, of uh, bonding and, uh, and, the, and the state's bond rating and some of the highlights. Um, we do have a, a, a path, which I did not bring, um, but uh, a, a bonding 101 and the debt metrics and the like, and we can send that over. I um, uh, wasn't sure what, what you were looking for today, but in general, the state has um, 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 a committee called the Capital Debt Affordability Advisory Committee, otherwise known as CDAC. Uh, I am the chair of the committee. The bond bank uh, has representation on it. Um, the, the president of the bond bank, as well as uh, the executive director, and um, um, and then the governor's appointees. And I have one appointee to see that. And uh, our charge um, is to um, is to look at the amount of debt uh, or bonding that a state can issue in any given year, or in our case, a biennium. Um, and uh, we look at basically three metrics as we're doing. We look at the economy too. We employ Jeff Carr to do some of the work on the um, on the uh, revenue estimates going forward. So he takes the consensus revenue and he pushes it out a little further, looking at some of the data. Obviously, the further you go out, uh, the more uh, volatility you have with those numbers. Um, but uh, we we take a look at that. Uh, we take a look at the overall economy. And then we look at three debt metrics um, that, uh, that are very important to the process. One is uh, debt per capita. So you take the amount of debt we have outstanding and you divide that by the population, you get a number for debt per capita. That number is helpful. Moody's uh, does a, Moody, a median, Moody's median, which looks at the, the three characteristics, including debt per capita on an annual basis. And uh, uh, debt per capita is described on page 18 of the annual report. Um, we, uh, in 2019, our debt per capita was $1,140. It's an increase over the, the previous year, which was 987. Uh, we went 25th out of 50 states. You want to rank 50, okay, so it's reverse order. In some years way back, we were ranked around 10. This is when uh, we over, overdid our bonding and uh, got ourselves in some trouble uh, back in the 70s and 80s. And in 1990, I believe, or 89 or 90, we created CDAC to start to work down our, our, our bonding. Um, we have a long-term member of that committee that I want to recognize, that's David Coates. And he's done a great job with us over the years in, um, in working with that committee and has a great historical knowledge of it. Um, yeah, yeah. How can we 
had a good bond rating when I was at a meeting the other day and they asked the question, if you owe $3 billion on pensions, I think it's $3 billion. Is it, am I correct, $3 billion? Uh, 2.2 in pensions and right. about, uh, about the same in health care. And we're not going to pay until 2038. 30, how, yep. how can we continue? Okay. It was a good bond rating if we owe that kind of money. Well, I would point out that that's not unusual. We're in kind of the median um, um, with, with, with states in terms of looking at some of the metrics. Moody's pointed out that um, while it's a substantial amount, that our, as a percentage of our own source income, um, it, uh, it was right in, in, in the numbers. And um, 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 I think that that's important. Where we had trouble with the bond rating was not so much the pensions were an issue, but the bigger issue was with an older, declining population, um, the ability to take on all of those liabilities and pay them in the future. So I think that the governor is absolutely right about demographics. Getting back to pensions, that is like taking your mortgage and saying that you have a three hundred million, uh, excuse me, three hundred thousand. If you have a three hundred million dollar mortgage, <laughs> I, want, I, I want, I want, I want, a couple of rooms in, the, you know, you know, in, in, in the place. But um, uh, it's like taking your mortgage and putting it on your balance sheet. And the fact of the matter is, you're going to be paying an amount every year, which we call the the actuarial determined employer contribution. They used to be called ARC actuarially required contribution. So I used to say pay the ARC, pay the ARC, pay the ARC. The reason that we got in trouble were a couple of things. One, we uh, didn't pay the ARC as, as recommended by the actuary. So when an actuary says you need to put in 25 million and you put in 15 million, you can't expect a good result. And you do that year in, year out. At home, when you're, um, when you're uh, trying to pay for the, your child's college education, or post-secondary education, whatever it might be, if you start putting the money in as a sophomore year of high school, you're probably not going to meet your finance goals. If you start in grade school, but then you say, I'm going to skip it through junior high because we've got some expenses um, to pay, you know, you want to do the roof and all these other things, um, you're probably still not going to meet your goal because you're not getting the value of compound interest. We did that consistently from the early 90s. Um, I read a report from the Joint Fiscal Office uh, dated in 1989 and talking about why we shouldn't put all the money into the 1990 pensions. Um, we did it all the way up to 2007, so expecting a different result. The Great Recession also had an impact, but it had an impact across the country, um, and uh, so that's been an issue for us. Um, and, uh, so what are we doing to correct that so, situation? How are we going to go on forever and not change the pension or something? Because 2038, I mean, that's what, 18 years from now? Uh, but it's also one third of the way through the mortgage. Um, so it's like a 30 year mortgage. We're one third of the way through because we started this in 2008. Um, and we are on target. We've done what's called a, a risk assessment that includes a stress test. I want to make that clear when folks say that we haven't done a stress test. We did a very vigorous stress test. And what we found was that. Uh, and the difference also between the risk assessment and when an actuary report takes a point in time, June 30th, and it says this is what your liability is. What we said in the, in the risk assessment, the stress test, assume we're filling those positions and creating new people into the pension system and we'll get it. And what they said is um, uh, that we're on target uh, and we can do it, but it also said there's considerable volatility. Uh, so, you know. And we want to deal with that volatility. So we have a working group uh, made up of the administration, the retirement boards, the unions, because you need to have employee groups involved, uh, and the legislature. We've been meeting, and we've said everything is on the table. And we're taking a look at what we can do um, uh, to, to lower that volatility going forward. Because our rules says you can't continue on this. I heard them the other night. You can't continue on this, on this track. And because you've got to change the future. And we we're obligated to pay the past, but are we changing the future? And I, I don't know enough well, about it. Well, I would argue that uh, the future um, struggles with the defi defined benefit plan is the most cost-effective way to pay for pensions. Um, and states that have changed to other systems, for instance, West Virginia, Michigan, Alaska, um, um, they've actually, West Virginia was a DB plan, defined benefit, switched to DC plan, and then switched back because they said it was costing them more money and they were losing recruitment. 
Um, I've done the numbers on defined contribution plans. I did not bring them with me, Senator, but I'd be happy to bring them in a subsequent meeting. And a defined benefit plan would cost you more money, clearly in the short term, and my friends, um, including David, have acknowledged that in the short term. Um, the argument is that in the long term it would be a benefit. I've done the analysis of other states that have done that and found that it actually cost them more. The unfunded liability continued to rise. Uh, for different reasons, and again, I'd be happy to come back and do a full presentation on this. I've, I've got quite a bit of literature and analysis uh, on this. But our estimates were that it would cost, in the short term, about 20 some odd million dollars more for the state system, uh, because um, right now the normal cost, the amount of money that you, not for the unfunded liability, for the state system is roughly 3% of payroll, and for the teachers, 1% of payroll. So you'd be replacing a DC plan with that. Let me just stop it for a yep. second. There's good news and there's bad news. The good news is by 2038, you and I will be six feet under. Yeah. But the guy that was supposed to That's be on the lawn around our grave site, he won't be able to get paid. <laughs> I, just, I just can't believe we're three billion dollars when I heard that. It's not million billion. Right. And how they have we were talking about. I can't believe we got any credit rating in this state. Well, what's more disturbing is that we're, as you said, somewhere in medium. the middle. So think yeah. about it spread across the country. Yeah. Well, I'm thinking about Vermont. Yeah, and the, and the states that are in biggest trouble are the ones that didn't pay their, their dollars um, or did benefit increases, enhancements, um, uh, despite that. And we have not. Um, we're working with the unions, we're working with uh, the administration to look at ways to, to lower this liability. Uh, again, I would argue that a DC plan will cost you more money. Again, that normal cost is 3% of payroll and 1% of well, payroll. Well, somewhere along the line, you or the treasurer and, and, and like our old folks people got to agree on something. We are working we're, on that. We're going down the hole here and we're not yeah. coming out. Well, I would point out it's that that's why we have a, a, a working group that incorporates the administration, the General Assembly, the employees, the trustees of the retirement system, the treasurer's office, and the chair of the Vermont Pension Investment Committee. But well, we've also made a lot more progress recently than had been made in the more. Well, we're paying down the liability. Past. Now, when you look at a mortgage, remember when you do a mortgage, you're paying interest first and then principal. So we're just about the point um, where we're starting to dig into the principal. Um, and if you look at the teacher's system, uh, for the, it's it's kind of held steady. Now, next year, we're probably going to lower the interest rate, uh, and so it's going to push up the liability a bit. But uh, remember that the teacher's plan, which is very poorly funded, uh, in addition to not funding in the 90s, we took health care costs out of that without budgeting that. Up to 2014, we did that. And they're, they're in the 55%, but if you look at their numbers, and let me see if I can find the page on that. Teacher plan. They have a good plan. I know that. Nothing wrong. Uh, if you look at the numbers, they were at 55.6, uh, 54.22 in 17, 55.22 and 55.65. It's not a lot, but it's not going the wrong direction, and it's starting to edge up. The state system, if you look at it, 70.7 versus 70.67. That's a little bit of de decimal dust. Uh, this is on page tw um, eight. You know, we, we're working on this, we've got a team together, we've done a risk assessment that includes a stress test. Um, I will point out that um, if you'd like me to come in um, and talk about this further, I will do that and critique also what I found to be egregious errors in the uh, Vermont uh, uh, Roundtable uh, presentation. Um, total misunderstandings of, of, um, of how pensions work. Uh, not David's stuff, I will tell you that um, um, uh, just um, I have a lot of respect for David Coates, we want a lot of different groups together, and David's numbers are always rock solid. We disagree on the solution, but his numbers are rock solid, and we talk about those numbers. But so other numbers are going to agree on the solution because, as I see it, we're going down too fast. Well, I would um, be happy to have a, a separate presentation on this if, um, if the chair wants me to do that. It sounds like an idea we ought to be talking about at some point. Be happy to do that. My immediate concern is everybody that's been coming in here to testify is somebody that might be looking for money. Yes. I keep dropping the seed with them that we are probably looking at less money to be available in the next yes. capital bill cycle. Yes. Um, I guess I'd like to hear from you sure. on 
what's going on with that? Sure. So um, uh, there are a lot of folks that uh, look at bonding um, as, a, as a solution to, a fine, uh, to getting some money into the system. And what I would argue is, uh, and if you look at page 16, I actually, as a deputy treasurer, wrote this piece um, in, in the 2009 um, uh, Transportation Infrastructure um, uh, Bond Program. And I said at the time, we said bonding makes sense, and I still believe this. The cost saved to accelerated co um, construction uh, exceeds the interest paid on the funds. In other words, the inflation rate on a bond might be uh, uh, three uh, three percent, but the cost of inflation on uh, construction uh, contracts, for instance, eight percent or whatever. So it makes sense to do it now. Um, second is a quantifiable economic benefit that exceeds the cost of borrowing. Now, I should have in this report darkened, bloated the word quantifiable, made it 16-point um, font, um, um, put italics on it, and underlined it. Uh, everybody tells me, well, this is a great benefit, da 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 da, da. Yeah, it has to be quantifiable. Um, you know, we have to work with data. We're a data-driven um, department and in terms of our recommendation. And second, a future identifiable and um, uh, reliable revenue source exists to pay the bonds. There is a fourth one that I didn't put in here called intergenerational equity. And the thought process on that is if you build a school now, future generations are going to use that school, so they should pay some portion of it. Now, I, I get that principle. It's a philosophical difference sometimes between folks about how much. When I look at a, at a bond and I say the interest rate is uh, 26 to 28, 30 percent, of the, uh, uh, the interest uh, that's going to be paid on it versus the, uh, the principal, I say, is that intergenerational worth $14 million of interest or $13 million of interest? So we have to have that conversation as well. But those are the parameters that I, as a treasurer, recommend when you are looking at what are you putting in to the capital debt affordability um, process and what are you putting in the capital bill. Is metrics related to this? We'd be happy to assist on that. But to me, that's a, that's a basic principle. So when you hear folks that are saying that we should bond more, uh, I would be cautious. Uh, simply put, we have a capital debt affordability committee. We look at three items. As I mentioned, debt per capita is one. Debt as a percentage of, uh, of income is the, um, is the next one. I'm going to try to go to the pages here. So debt as a percentage of personal income on page 19. It's fully explained. Uh, what we do there is that's an that's a issue to me of taxpayer affordability. And we're bumping up and we're moving up. Uh, we moved, um, uh, you know, uh, as a percentage of states, we, we dropped from um, uh, uh, 28 to 26. And again, remember, it's the reverse. You want to have, you know, 50 is your, is your, is your perfect number there. Um, and we're seeing that tick up slightly. Uh, when we put in a bond, um, it could be a housing bond, it could be an energy efficiency bond, but we modeled one at uh, around 50 million and we round, round, did one at uh, 20, 25 or 27. Uh, what we found was the interest rate uh, was high, but it also pushed up this parameter as we were looking at it, and that's in your, the appendices of the housing report. So it pushed us up to our, our limits that we have set as a policy limit um, in, in, in CDEC. So what we're saying is it's starting to become an affordability issue for the taxpayer. This is not about the bond ready. This is about affordability for the taxpayer. So debt as a percentage of personal income. The third one is debt as a percentage of revenue, debt service actually as a percentage of revenue. So how much is debt service? How much of a percentage of total revenue, you know, the general fund or, uh, we are receiving? And um, is you know does is there room for that? And we've got a little room on that one, but I get worried about debt as a percentage of personal income. Um, and we are going to be evaluating these criteria because these we've had these for quite some time. We're going to evaluate the metrics in the fall when we do our next report, um, and we may have some tweaking to those. But uh, when you look at our numbers, um, we are now issuing. Um, we are now paying more debt service than we are um, um, issuing. We're, we're, it's, it's a, uh, and we need to be careful. Um, we've got um, uh, uh, some strains on our capital budget affordability. And over the last six years, we've recommended approximately a 23% reduction over those, that six years of the bienniums. 
Um, I can't tell you what the number will be until we do the metrics. We do the, the look at the economy. We look at the metrics themselves, and are they reasonable? But I wouldn't, I, so I can't say it's 20 million or 30 million or 10 million, but what I will say is that I think that any thought that it's going to jump up radically, it may stay the same, maybe it moves up a little bit, um, but I don't see a, a, um, an opportunity for, um, for including a, a, a whole range of additional bond um, initiatives um, in, in this number. This is CDAC that's going to eventually flesh out that number? Yes. So we do that every fall. And what we do is we do it for a biennium. So we did it uh, two years ago uh, for the 20 and 21 biennium. So you have a number. The only difference that happens in that number is are two things. One, this committee does a, a hard look. Um, this was a recommendation the Treasurer's Office made in 2011. Um, at the projects and the utilization. So if somebody, and you came up with a solution that said, if, um, if they're not using their money in, after two years, we want them to come in and tell us why they should keep it. And you, we, we, you take uh, residual dollars out of capital projects that you've done, or capital projects that aren't expending or not getting off the, um, off the, um, uh, the, the paper and onto reality. Uh, so that's a good thing. The other is you get bond premiums. So when we sell bonds, particularly in a low interest rate environment, we get some premium. This year, that's a fairly substantial amount, about 11.2 million, and that's built into the capital budget. Um, as interest rates rise, that will go away. Um, and I would say budgeting um, with that is, is a poor idea because you never know when you sell the bonds what that's going to look like. It can be 2 million, it can be 11 million, it can be zero. Um, so I wouldn't. Um, bet the farm on that going forward. How often do the ratings agencies meet to discuss for bonds and stats? Uh, they meet annually to take a look and do a, do a temperature check. We talk to them generally every six months uh, by phone uh, to give them an update. Um, so we will probably catch up with them because uh, we talk to them in August. It's going to be a little bit of a stretch, but we'll probably talk to them probably in May um, or so on after the session is done. I hope we're done by May. Um, um, but um, uh, maybe we'll talk to them late May, and we'll give them an update on what happened with the budget, uh, what's happened with our cash position. That's an important piece to them. What's happened with pensions and the improvements that we're going to make. Um, and um, um, we, we will have a conversation with them um, in midterm, uh, and then we have a conversation at the time we're issuing bonds. Typically, we issue bonds in the fall. CDAC only meets annually? Uh, CDAC meets four, depending on the year. So the year that you're doing the initial biennium, they'll probably have four meetings to start in late summer and start to work through that. Um, um, maybe five if you need them. This year, since we're going to look at the metrics, we'll probably have another. We also have a working group that's looking at how you can do more cash instead of bonding for capital projects. Um, it's a proposal that, that, that I made um, based on an experience I had in a, in a previous municipality in creating a structure that creates cash as opposed to bonding. Um, and you can use that for short, shorter term uh, capital projects that have a shorter useful life, for instance. Uh, you know, we talk about IT and different things, and do they fit in there? Um, and, and that's a conversation we can have. We use that in a town that, um, that I was previously employed at. It became very, very effective, and then several other towns in Connecticut um, 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 brought into the same type of model. So I'm going to be presenting that uh, as an option, uh, working uh, with a work group. Uh, and there are other options that the administration is looking at as well, uh, so the secretary. So we have a small work group that's going to be working on that. Uh, and then we, we're going to be looking as a whole on the debt metrics. So we'll probably have more than the, the typical four meetings that we have. The second year, we probably have two or three meetings uh, because we're, we're updating the numbers. And it's rare that we, we actually haven't had a circumstance where we said in the interim one that you need to change a number of life is going downhill. It could. Uh, but we, uh, last year, we just reaffirmed the, uh, the, the biennium recommendation. So when CDAC meets and these working groups meet, mm -hmm. Any time that they come to conclusions about something, is that information shared with the bonding agencies? Uh, yes, they see our, our capital debt affordability advisory um, um, our report. Uh, we also have to uh, report every year uh, in June um, uh, on, on um, uh, a standardized reporting structure. It's called EMMA. The, um, and I'm not 
don't ask me what EMA stands for, but uh, we, we have to report uh, disclosure information each year, um, and also our bonds are on there. So they, they do keep an eye. They read our newspapers. I mean, they're asked questions about things that they see in, 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 in uh, Seven Days or Digger or um, um, or up north, you know, in, in, in your, uh, your uh, Cal yeah, you got it. They look at everything, um, and they're, um, they're, they're um, if they see issues, they're asked us about them. Um, and uh, so what they typically do is give us some idea of what they want to talk about. One of the things, by the way, that they're talking about in every state is climate change now and risk mitigation efforts. So that was on our list. And I talked to a couple of other treasurers because it was the first time I saw it on our list. And, uh, and they said, yeah, we had it too. Um, so it's becoming a, a, a big issue uh, with the rating agencies. In fact, Moody's. They do a lot with climate change. <laughs> yeah. uh, what they did is they actually bought um, a, a, um, a, a interest, Moody's, in a uh, company that does analysis of risk processes and mitigation and, uh, and, and climate change. So that's becoming a big issue for them because they're looking at you have odd weather events like Irene, you know what I mean? Um, when you, uh, and that's the becoming more frequent and they're becoming more, you know, um, the norm as opposed to the, um, to the extreme. Um, and they're looking at what are the risk mitigation strategies. For instance, we took them through a tour uh, back in 2014 or 15, my memory, and the, the years kind of, you know, all meshed together, as you know. Um, and we took them on a tour of the uh, Waterbury site as it was being constructed. So they, we had to all put on hard hats and uh, and, and, and uh, boots. So we told them to take those with them when they, you know, put them in there. Not the hard hats, but the uh, the hard boots uh, when they, uh, they they showed up here. And we took them all all three rating agencies through there because we had <coughs> risk mitigation in terms of the uh, in terms of the uh, the flooding there. And also, a, I don't remember if it was thirty or forty percent, but a substantial amount of operating cost reductions. Um, and in fact, we sold green bonds. Uh, based on the um, improvements to the um, uh, to that building, so that was a good moment to show a risk mitigation strategy. That was for the purpose of climate change questions. Uh, well, that was for the purpose of, of just a general meeting, but they were interested in what our risk ma mitigation was um, uh, post Irene. So you're, you're just leading me down another road, mm -hmm. but our mental health facilities, mm -hmm. as well as our prison systems, are they looking at those? Absolutely, they look at infrastructure. So it's a tough balance because you don't want a lot of debt, but you also have needs. Mm -hmm. right. And it's a tough balance, and that's where, you know, when you go back to what is a, a cri the criteria you use to what's a good candidate for bonding. And, you know, we recommended four right now, three in the report and a fourth one for me. Those are things that I think are extremely important. You have others that are important to you. Uh, we have offered in the past, and we will be happy to do it, um, any, um, any looks at cost benefit of um, any one or internal rate of um, a return on the particular item that's in the, in, the, um, in the capital plan. Again, it's about prudent use of debt. Uh, this state has done a good job on that. Um, and I commend you for continuing to do that. I would also say it would be a mistake um, to um, to exceed the seed act limit and say that we're going to ignore that. That we get points for that, not just on the debt side, but you know, in the pieces where they look at our fiscal management and uh, in our financial stability, we get um, bonus points um, at the end of the. There's a notch that they give on the rating agency calculations for that, and we don't want to lose that. Try to plant that seed with everybody that comes in the door. I don't want that to happen on my watch. Yes. Uh, okay. Yeah. We'll just keep that. Yeah. Well, you know, this is um, uh, it was unfortunate that um, um, that uh, we we did go down. A lot of it is aging population, workforce, and the ability to pay those liabilities vis-a-vis -vis that. Uh, again, not the liability itself as much as the ability to pay for it with a declining population. Um, we. Um, I was we the demographic government. part of that, but I, I'm just now beginning to realize that our infrastructure is also a part of yes. what they are considering. Yes. Infrastructure, our ability, risk mitigation around climate, uh, again, they, they, they love the tour. Um, and, uh, and I think it was very instructive about how we responded. Yeah. We didn't just rebuild on a site that, uh, uh, you know, that, that had uh, potential for flooding without doing mitigation strategies. So, so I guess my question is, you know, how do you, 
with the demographics being kind of the big girl in the room, um, how much is it countered by the risk mitigation? And are, are there things, is there enough that we can do to, to counteract mm -hmm. that kind of um, downside yep. of, of our well, situation? I think that there are different ways you can handle it. Uh, I'm going to go to the transportation fund for a minute. And um, we, you know, we've got a record amount in there. We've, we've had really significant number of dollars, um, I'd say, since 2010, there were about um, starting to see some significant improvements there. We also did a, um, a bonding proposal called Transportation Infrastructure Bonds, and we have a small one there. Uh, the Senator remembers all this. Um, and um, what we said in that is we're collecting an assessment called the Motor Fuel Transportation Infrastructure Assessment. I'll leave it at that. And uh, that's going toward paying the tips. Um, but also, when there's extra cash, that can be used. Uh, in other words, you're collecting more than you need for the debt service reserves. You can use that for other needs in the, uh, in the um, in, in transportation. And they are. They're using a lot of that for PAYGO as opposed to new bonds. And I commend them for that because you're, losing, you're, 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 you're increasing the, the, the value of those dollars because you're not putting future dollars into interest payments. So I would commend them on that. I think um, the Secretary of Administration, uh, Suzanne and I, uh, are looking along with our staff and our staff at ways uh, and making recommendations to do similar types of things in the general fund, whether it's the capital, the CNRE fund, whether it's another model with the trust fund. We are looking at ways to try to help with that. The balance that we have is the decision making that you make and how much and what is the value of the things because we give you the amount. We tell you how much you can put on the credit card and what you're saying is these are the things we think that belong there. And I would recommend the criteria that, I, that I've stated to you. You have other criteria. We're willing to help uh, in that process. But the decision making, the balance about this infrastructure versus this is something that, uh, that lies with this committee. And you don't want me telling you what, uh, what things you should build. Uh, but it's important to think about that. And it's important to recognize that uh, some things have more value than others. And it's also the long-term value of it, you know. Uh, fixing a bridge now versus waiting for it to get really bad um, is going to cost you, um, you, know, uh, you know, pay me now or pay me a heck of a lot more down the road. Senator Lyons has a question. Well, I mean, I think you've answered mo most of what I was thinking about and asking. But when you mentioned green bonds mm -hmm. last, so can you first define green bonds and all? Yeah, to... That's an interesting question because green bonds are badly defined. Mm -hmm. uh, but they're basically sustainability bonds that, that, that um, support capital projects that um, work in renewable energy, energy efficiency, and the like. Um, the advantage of green bonds is it expands the market because people that are interested and concerned about those issues are now likely buyers of those bonds. So it, it, uh, the belief is that over time that will create uh, more market and, you know, when you have more markets, you can get better rates. Um, so uh, that was why we did it. Um, uh, we were one of the first states to do a green bond. Um, there are certain criteria in there. Um, and, uh, but the criteria have been in the past not as well defined as starting to get a little, little more rigorous. I, I remember when Duke did their initial analysis of environmental bonds, and I think mm -hmm. it relates to that. That's why I was asking that. It relates to yeah. that. Then there's an, another. You were talking about prioritizing yes. and the job that we have in here and the job that you have out there, but so much of what we're seeing now is it could be construed as social infrastructure. I mean, everything from mental health systems. Yep. And, uh, and then if you're talking about mitigation of climate change with planning to get yep. people who like uh, think about um, the 911 folks who have the care program and identifying where people are that cost money to, mm -hmm. to do that. And then to once you have that system in place, yep. do, do, do we ever, I, I know, I like the idea of environmental bonding because then you can target it. I knew so, you would. Yeah, I knew you knew, you knew I would. <laughs> but I also wonder what the social bond piece is. Not you mean like a social impact bond? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. A social impact bond is, is a different, um, different um, animal, so to speak. 
uh, of course, with a different color. Yeah, it is. Um, what they what what it is is um, is that um, um, some investors will put in money and they will base it on performance. So if you meet a certain performance um, um, metric. Uh, you get uh, they will they will get a lower rate of return essentially on their dollars, um, and so it's kind of a uh, a way of incentivizing. Uh, you need very clear metrics with that, and you need uh, very uh, you need a good pool of investors. So it's the upfront money to save save money down the road. Uh, yeah, that's a normal uh, thing. Sometimes people will call something a social um, an impact bond. Uh, that isn't. I read one in, uh, in D.C., for instance, it was called uh, a uh, social impact bond. But when you read under the uh, under the hood, it was really a general obligation bond with social needs associated. Social needs associated. associated. Yeah. So it's a little different um, structure um, that, than we're used to in this state. Um, and uh, uh, you do need a good infusion of cash from, uh, from an investor that's willing to take on those, uh, those issues. So for instance, the corrections, they've used it there in other states. So um, that theoretically, you lower the recidivism uh, rate by doing certain um, structural changes to the way we do business. And um, by lowering that recidivism rate, you lower theoretically, and plus as a backfill, um, um, your corrections cost. Um, you know, uh, and there are ways to do that. I'm going to put a plug in for, for a project that I'm familiar with out in Burlington called Mercy Connections. Mm -hmm. They do mentoring. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and this is kind of common sense we should be looking at. So uh, the cost of incarceration, now my numbers are stale, but at one point was someplace to, to incarcerate a woman was someplace around 79000 That's what. It's 80, at least. 80. There you go. Um, and the cost of this, um, and the recidivism rate was above 50%. You probably have a better understanding. Um, is that about fair? Um, I'm not sure exactly what the numbers are for women. I know that 64% of our incarcerated individuals are people who have been brought back in on a furlough violation. Another conversation yeah. down that road, but um, I'm not sure exactly what the numbers yeah. are. For but it's high. It's high. And I commend you, by the way, for being able to, because uh, I like data-driven decision making. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, but well, if you want to go down that road, it's the two biggest drivers of that are lack of housing and lack of employment. There you go. There you go. Yeah. So um, on the um, on the other side, uh, Mercy Connections does one-on-one -on -one mentoring. Mm -hmm. uh, at the time that th that I was involved with this. Uh, the, the cost was 1700 bucks, okay, and the recidivism rate was between 12 and 15 percent. Now, I like the numbers. They work. And models like that, so in housing, for instance, we now have supportive housing uh, models in this state. Housing First and SASH, although I can't remember off the top of my head what SASH stands for, but uh, it's a great program. And supportive services are helping people uh, stay, at home. stay at home, and it helps with crime, it helps with homelessness, uh, it helps people with special needs. And these are the kind of smart investments we should be making. Now, I will point out that you can make those smart investments without bonding. And you know, when I hear, and I'm just going to be blunt, well, we don't have the money for it, or we don't have the political will for it, the easiest thing to do is to say, well, let's just bond for it, and we'll let the next generation worry about it. That's not my philosophy. Um, I want to be looking at you know, this as a long-term investment in the state. And we should look where we can, uh, whether it's existing revenues, because uh, I'm not opposed to that when they're reliable, dependable, and uh, available, um, and uh, or it's new revenues. Uh, the bottom line is that cash appropriations are a lot better than bonding for things. And if we can do that, we should do it. Do the ratings agencies get this far down into the weeds? Yes. They, they really do a, a lot of analysis. I will tell you that um, one of them went through our balance sheet and the reserves and the fund balance and wanted an explanation on each one. And uh, we gave it to them. Uh, we get a lot of follow-up calls. Um, and uh, it's pretty detailed. Um, um, I'm going to be sentimental for a minute. I remember sitting with Jim Reardon going through all that, that stuff, um, and I miss him. Mm -hmm. and, and we all miss him. Um, and uh, uh, he had it all in the top of his head. i got to look at my reports. But uh, but he was as data-driven. Uh, and so, so frankly, are, are, are the administrations um, after him in terms of both the Shumlin administration and the Scott administration. To me, making the decisions based on facts and data 
um, are important in making a decision that doesn't push it off to future generations to figure out how to handle that debt burden is extraordinarily important to me. And it should be for the rest of the state. Yes. And, and I agree with you on most of that. And I, I prefer to pay for things in cash. Mm -hmm. um, and I like that idea. But I'll bring one example up as we struggle with space in our next segment, uh, talking about space issues in this building. Mm -hmm. When I first got to the house, there was this beautiful proposal to expand the state house so that it would work for the people mm -hmm. of the state of Vermont. Committee rooms would be bigger, there would be offices for legislators, more meeting rooms. It, it, it was a beautiful development and it was $6.3 million. At that point, the House was the wiser body because Senator Starr and I were there. Um, and the Senate pushed back so on now it. The Senate's the wiser body. You got it. Oh, the you got it. She's a quick study. Um, the Senate pushed back and said, we don't want the perception that people will think we're spending money on ourselves. And I always argued it was for the people. Well, two years later, we cut back the proposal, and the estimate had gone up to 8 or $10 million. Two go. years later, well, yeah. we cut back that the expansion. But what I'm saying, but what, no, but what I'm getting at, Dick, is sometimes, depending on the economy and the interest rates, you can't afford to wait. There's the economy number here. Um, the, you know, the cost saved to uh, accelerate construction. What I would say, however, is that you have to make that decision about that $6.9 million within the context of what your overall debt um, mm -hmm. should be. Agreed. So if you're at home and you say, this is the best project to do because I'm going to, you know, two years from now, it's going to cost me double. Okay, and I'm going to get my roof fixed now or whatever it is. You still have to look at how much can I afford. Mm -hmm. and, Absolutely, and for me, that's an important discussion that yeah. gets lost sometimes in the political. Mm -hmm. The political shortcut is to put just bond for it, which is why we've made the recommendation the process for CDAC because our bonding got out of control. Um, and, um, um, when I first yeah. well, I when I first came that. in I when I first that. came in I think we were only spending thirty two million dollars a year mm -hmm. in two thousand three. Mm -hmm. We had a very small we capital bill. Years in here, Bobby was over hundred million. We with Bob getting it was chair. Yeah, it was. Um, yeah. We've got a chart on that, dollars. and we've adjusted it for inflation. I will call it the. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, what's the name of the legislator? Oh, uh, Cynthia as well. Cynthia. So we call it the Cynthia Browning chart uh, because Cynthia said, you haven't adjusted for inflation, yeah. so we, we renamed it the Cynthia Browning yeah. chart. That said, uh, uh, and we looked at it, even adjusting for inflation, the general trend has been down, but the last couple of years post Irene has gone up a little bit, and we need to say, stop it, okay? That's our debt outstanding. And that's why we've lowered the debt issuance by 23% the recommendation over the last six years because we're trying to bend that curve the other direction mm -hmm. because we're still living with those $20 million, I mean, those 20-year bonds that uh, were done earlier um, and having to uh, retire those. So what I would say to you there is that if that was the preferred project, and I understand the politics of it, okay, um, then you need to prioritize that versus other buildings, versus parks, versus corrections. <laughs> and make that decision within the context of what you can afford. Right. And that's what this committee has to do. Um, it's a tough job. It's a really tough job, and I'm glad I don't have to do it. Um, and uh, I would also point out that you get such perks, you know, big yeah. office staff, yeah. you know, and, uh, and well, offices yeah, and nice stuff. Yeah. Office. Yeah. I tell you, it's amazing. Two but um, but I, I will say thank you for what you do, because you don't get paid a lot. You don't have a lot of frills you know, here and stuff uh, in terms of, you know, your office space, the staff and all that. What you do is for the people, and I want to say thank you for what you do. Um, but we have to be within the, you know, That's the, why we're three and a half billion dollars in the hole. Wow. And Chef? We, um, we need to make sure that when we say no to people who are trying to advance that bonding, that we have to come out of here believing you have our back on that. I do. Now, I will tell you that I think housing is a legitimate um, uh, use of this because especially the first criteria, the second quantifiable economic benefits, you know, the grand list, all, all the pieces of what it leverages, it's a good use. 
you have to make a determination whether that versus some other need and make that determination within the confines of CDAC. The walleye guys will definitely need their <laughs> The what? The walleye guys. Yeah. 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 Or the, uh, uh, the uh, royal, uh, the, the trail. Yeah. Yeah. Trail, yeah. yeah. trail, trail, trail. trail, trail. Well, well, one of the things I see is that you're using a lot of it to fund the VHCV piece mm -hmm. within the capital budget rather than using mm -hmm. the, uh, the, the statutory amount which is the property transfer tax. And what I was, yeah, and um, if you look at the housing report, that big one that has more appendices than, uh, than, um, uh, than report, and you get to page 24 and 25. So page 25 is, I had to put graphs in. You know me, I have graphs, you know, everywhere. Um, someone said that they're going to put a you know, graph with an X and Y curve on my tombstone. You know what I, mean? so I said, I hope the trend line is going up and not down. But um, if you take a look, the, uh, the greenish blue line, it depends on whether you're colorblind, I guess, um, is a property transfer uh, tax revenues, which have gone up. Uh, you take a look at the reddish line, uh, that is the statutory amount of the uh, property transfer tax, and VHCB's appropriation is the. Uh, is the um, gray or whatever you call it lying there and you see the gap is increasing um, and if you look over here in the chart you see the same thing notwithstanding notwithstanding um, um, any law whatever the term that you use is, a, is, is one of the, the toughest things in statute you've got a statutory amount someone comes in and pays their property transfer tax and you say well it's being used for housing it's being used for conservation and they say oh okay okay we're not doing that. We're using it for other resources. We should be using that dedicated revenue that's been established for, uh, for VHCB for VHCB. And that would help you with some of the backfill in the capital plan as well, um, as you're looking at it, or the capital budget, because you do have money in there uh, for them as well. Um, fully funded the, uh, the uh, prop, prop, uh, VHCB and the property transfer tax, fully using that um, is, is our number one recommendation. And uh, you know, and I said it straight out. Uh, they've been shortchanged over the years. So, Time to correct that. And, and I certainly appreciate that and the mm -hmm. idea of paying cash. Mm -hmm. um, can you comment on the what the bond houses um, reaction was to the thirty-seven million dollar bond? Well, that we um, it was done essentially around the same time we were we were doing some of the rating pieces. Uh, Moody's included in our net tax supported debt. Uh, uh, we did, we've had some conversation about the results. Um, we did not um, at that point know uh, that it would not be net, it would be treated as net tax supported debt. So we did not have that conversation with the rating agencies. We will in the future. Um, again, I think it's got a quantifiable economic benefit. It's done some good things. The question is, what else do you have in the capital bill? And does it, does it have a quantifiable quantified economic benefit and does it do good things and that's the um, the decision making that you have as I said the political will to get these things done versus putting it off to the next generation and if you take a look at it VHCB um, has to pay 1.5 million out of their budget uh, for debt service uh, for the first bond if you were to do another bond let's say they have another three to four million dollars over the years that's a substantial amount that's taken out. Now, down the road, you might want to put some of those dollars into Rutland or to Newport or to St. Jay. Um, uh, where do you live? <laughs> Glover. Glover, okay. Um, and, uh, and you might say, now I'm constrained because I now have to pay this debt service, so let's do another bond um, and, and, and cover that, okay? And that's how we ended up with the pension problem, sir, okay? And that's because we put things off to the next generation. We can't do that. Um, we need to make the decisions um, to, to be prudent with our dollars. Well, you're speaking about the next generation. My email box has suddenly opened up with demands that I divest us of fossil fuels. Uh -huh. And literally, I mean, it just opened up today, so I have to use really? some organizations. Mine too? Oh, thank you. Mine too. <laughs> Mine too. We've had this discussion before, but I don't know what the current status is. Okay. Uh, our status has not changed. We did do an environmental social governance report called ESG. It's on the front of our web page, so take a look at that. 
and it shows the value of our constructive engagement and some of the things that we've done in the pension fund to be a little more green and prudent at the same time. Uh, I will give you an example. Our, our Kadian is one of our managers. And when they're looking to, to buy a security, they, they put it into their, 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 their analysis. And that analysis includes a presumption that there's going to be a carbon tax. Now, whether it is or not, but it, what it does is it gives a bias toward that in its selection process. It's not screening. It is not um, divestment. Um, it's prudent financial management because they're looking at the economic trends going forward, contingencies, risk management going forward, and making investment selections based on that. I think that's a very good process. Uh, we recently bought uh, into some uh, in a, 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 um, a private equity that does clean technologies for farming, lowering the use of pesticides and things like that. So we're looking at opportunities to do those things. We're also engaging. Uh, you know, one of the criticisms that uh, we had was that uh, where we had the power to engage, we had never co-filed um, any any um, any um, uh, corporate resolutions. Uh, we've now done 17 as of last year, and we're now going to be sponsoring, not co-filing, but sponsoring a couple of this year. We don't know the answer to that because when you file, the company has the ability to go to the SEC and say, we don't want it or the ability to walk through it with you and negotiate with you and have it removed if there's some positive result. So we don't know where we are on that. You know, we're looking at everything from um, um, uh, opioid issues to, um, to um, uh, a really uh, dense one where you're looking at how they, they respond to contingent liabilities on their balance sheet with uh, opioids. It's a really you know, a uh, really sexy one that everybody wants to join, uh, but it's, it's important. Um, we're looking at a number of different issues and we're engaging. So one of the things that you find in that report is what we put, ask every single manager that we deal with. How do you manage, how do you recognize climate change? How do you build that into your model? And how does that impact your investment decisions? And uh, as well as other ESG questions. And we have their responses we summarize their responses, summar sent them back to them and said, is this what you mean? Because it's going to be a public document. And they're in that document for you to review. So I think that if you can move an investment company, instead of my $100 million that's with um, ABC Investment Company, instead of ha moving $100 million and say, I'm not going to use you anymore because you have fossil fuels, if you can change their process and they have $5 billion of assets or $10 billion of assets under management, you can make a change in those companies. And we're seeing that the, the, the process that we're using helps. We combine our efforts with New York, California, uh, other states, Connecticut, uh, and work together. Rhode Island, um, uh, we've got a tr truly great treasurer down there, Seth Magaziner. All together, by pooling our efforts, we're making changes in those companies. That, to me, is a much more responsible way than divestment. To me, divestment is walking away from the table and saying, it's your problem because that's what you're doing when you walk away. And somebody else buys the bond or buys the equity um, and uh, the stock and says, I, I don't care about the environment at the corporate governance meeting. So we're making changes. Uh, they're slow, but they're there. And uh, we're starting to see that in industries um, that uh, in investment managers in terms of their decision making around uh, ESG issues in general and climate change in particular. So is fossil fuel still paying is what I'm wondering. Well, you know, when we were asked, uh, and that's the question that we asked. Because I, I met a guy last week, his, who runs a, mm -hmm. a investment firm, and all they do is sell fossil fuel short. Mm -hmm. That's their specialty. Well, we they have, short um, sell fossil yeah. fuel. At one point, we had some hedge funds that did that. We got out of hedge funds, to be very honest. Um, and uh, uh, I'm glad we did. Um, you know, we our companies make those decisions, and we asked them several years ago. We asked them about coal, and we said, "Is coal a good investment, um, or do you have coal, and why do you have it?" And we only had one coal position at the time um, because that company was going to be spinning off and creating it was natural gas, but uh, but leaving coal, and and they needed the capital to stay in, which is why our investment. Uh, manager said that we think this is a good investment. Mm -hmm. um, so we continue to look at that. I will tell you that the cost per barrel, when the divestment debate came up several a few years back, the cost per barrel was at a low, someplace around 20 something, 25, and then it went up to about 60, 70. Um, so I'd rather, you know, not sell low, to be very candid. 
Um, and then, you know, we continue to look at it, and our investment managers continue to look at it. And I think if you look at our, our, our ESG report and their responses to that, and we're going to ask more questions. One of the things that I was concerned about is we've got a lot of verbiage, but I want to see metrics. And so we've asked um, uh, Vinkerg, asked Sierra Club, uh, asked um, um, uh, uh, Clean U uh, to sit down with us and help us develop metrics. Uh, that the board would have to approve, the, or VPIC would have to approve, but to work on that. So I um, was just talking to uh, one member of that group today and saying we've got to get working on those metrics. I got diverted by the five reports that the legislature asked me to do this year, including the housing report. Uh, I want to thank you for all the projects, uh, but, uh, um, um, but it was worthwhile, to be honest. So just like short, running water. The short way yeah. of responding to my constituents, and it's assuming they're responding to my is to say simply, we're moving in your direction, we're not quite a bit able to be there yet. Yeah, we're moving in a direction, um, um, and we believe that divestment is 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 not a stretch. We've got a line in the report, I'll find you that section. Well, no, I'm you. just gonna say the long answer to my constituents is to say that and then embed your home phone number. There you go, <laughs> ask that. Uh, I wouldn't give them my home <laughs> questions you you know we'd be happy you know to, to answer that but I would direct them to the environmental social governance report to see the strategies we developed a five-point plan which is on our web page um, on how to move toward a, a cleaner economy uh, uh, um, renewable energies and, and, and other methodologies um, and we did this back in 2017 in this report the ESG report said what is our progress on all five uh, points so I direct them to the five-point letter. It's on our website. We'll give you the address. So that's and one page it, instead of my long uh, I, I long think explanation. you're going to end up back here on a couple of occasions before the year is yes. up. I need to get to Senator Starr and give these guys a break in the interim. So yep. we'll cut off here. And we'll... no, I want to say thank you. Thank and uh, we would be happy to come back and talk about any subject you want, including pensions. I want to know your, your solution to this uh, pension plan. Who would, how would you handle it next time? Okay. Oh, thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Val. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So uh, the subject is State House Space Study. Mm -hmm. I understand you want to have a contribution to that conversation. Well, thank you uh, for the time, uh, Master O'Man, Chief of Capitol Police. Um, I appreciated the effort put into uh, the space study that was done this year. I, I would. Uh, just open by saying that this, uh, I guess, a reminder that this was a short-term space needs study, and that at some point in time, the painful conversation is going to have to come up about the long-term um, space for the for the General Assembly, and um, I, I fully recognize that is going to be. Plain, painful uh, for all involved, but there's only so much lipstick you can continue to put on the pig. Uh, Sir, before you go on, I would just like to say it's simple. We eliminate the House, and then we have plenty of room, 30 senators, we divide the room up, you guys will have plenty of room, just get rid of the House of Representatives, we're all set. It's a good idea, so here are the ones that brought us in. You got another good idea. Yeah. Don't start that one. <laughs> I will tell you from the Capitol Police perspective, we've uh, we've grown by one full-time officer since I came on board uh, two and a half, almost three years ago. Um, I, I don't honestly know if the additional officer that I requested for next year made it into the governor's budget request. I confess that I don't honestly know how to read those yet. Um, I haven't learned that language. but. Um, I suspect that uh, we will continue to grow as the demands in our services do. Um, our demands increase every year. We have a nice, very steep growth chart in our calls for service, uh, both not only in number but in complexity. Um, your colleagues have successfully chummed the water sufficiently this year. If you could, I appreciate it. Um, but uh, there, there have been quite a number of um, 
fairly lengthy investigations we've had to open up uh, this year that take away from our our presence in the building. And so I expect as those continue to increase, the, our, our staff will necessarily uh, need to grow. Um, I believe, if I understand the history correct, our office around there by the elevator used to be a committee room. Um, and I, of course, well prior to me, but trying to run eight officers out of that small space in there is uh, extremely difficult at best. Uh, our um, uh, our needs honestly come down to a lot of human resource needs. I believe, uh, Senator, you heard some of them in the Joint in the Legislative Management Committee asking our, our officers just to be able to have a place to go and, and, and get out of the public eye for a few minutes during the day is kind of critical to their health and well-being. Not only just having a place to go to the bathroom, I mean, it takes a little bit to get all this stuff off, and there's no place in this building where that is uh, really available to us. Um, additionally, uh, Sarah Connell, my only female officer, brought up, you know, females have a whole different set of issues that, uh, that men aren't, that we aren't dealing with, and but we need to be respectful of that and understand what we need to do to make sure she has a, a, a place uh, to take care of those needs. Uh, additionally, we are hard pressed to uh, provide any place for our officers to uh, decontaminate or, or clean up after um, a, an incident. Uh, in addition to providing law enforcement services, we also provide, provide emergency medical services within the building, and that's always a question. Um, we can go, there's a, a shower on the top of one Baldwin Street, um, the Pink Lady, there's one in the Speaker's office, but reality we need to take a serious uh, look at, at that and to be able to provide those services. Um, six to eight times a year we open up a command center within the Capitol Complex to support uh, events that are going on either in this building or out on the lawn. Those are the six to eight times that we know about. Uh, that does not count the times that pop up on us uh, on short notice or uh, or additional major uh, events that occur out on the lawn. Currently, we're utilizing a, um, a conference room within the complex for that, and at some point in time, there really needs to be something that, that pays the, the right attention to that. I rely on Kevin's staff to set that up and take it down those times a year, and I think he's about ready to, to kick me to the curb because uh, it is a pretty uh, intensive operation to get that set up. And it takes that room out of play for the, for the remainder of that day. Um, the coat room, I know, was a large part of this study. Uh, the coat room has been on kind of on my list of things I'd love to see go away since uh, my first day here. It is an enormous security risk uh, for uh, placed objects and uh, removed objects. We have several coats and nice sets of boots and things go missing out of there every year. Um, we do not... I'm do you have an idea of what people would do with coats and boots if there was no coat room? Um, I suspect that members, I suspect there is a, a way for, to accommodate members and senators. Um, I think the public will be on their own. They'll probably end up carrying them with them or leaving them in their car. I know that's a, I know that's a burden, but um, not only the coats, but backpacks. You know, school groups come in here and they pile 7,500 backpacks up under a staircase. And, you know, we, we never worry about the 75 that came with the school group. It's the 76 that somebody drops in there with it uh, that, that remains a concern for us. Um, additionally, the, we, you know, we have no surveillance inside the building. So even though we know we have theft problems, uh, we're dealing with them already this session. There's no, um, there's no, we have not crossed that, that line to deploy surveillance cameras within the building. Actual theft beyond what you assume is somebody picking up the wrong jacket yes. or really of what sort of stuff? We have cash thefts this session already. Really? I'd rather not go too much deeper than no. that on the record. But, okay. Well, I, uh, I just, for my self-interest and the protection of my colleagues, I, we're, I'm just interested in knowing so that that's going on. 
currently we don't have a campus. I mean, yeah, yeah. I know there's and no it's security. Nice, it's nice to put another officer, but I mean, we, it, we it, should have cameras. There's no office. cameras. There's nobody posted on doors. I mean, so people can come and go pretty freely. What good is to have more officers on duty if you don't have any any material to oversee the whole place? That's that's my question. It's, it's open. This place is it's open. open. Right. The governor has open house. He and can walk right upstairs. And, and like. Uh, Wow. It, like Matt said, it, 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 it's a nightmare with the, and especially, like you said, with the uh, backpacks. Anybody could bring anything in in a backpack mm -hmm. and drop it off or hang it in the coat room and they're gone. Um, the coat room seems to be the lowest hanging fruit in trying to take care of immediate needs. One of the diagrams that I see has a combination of Sergeant at Arms, your office, and IT. Your thoughts? So A, B, C, or B, sir? This would be A, diagram A. So with option A, when I, when I went through and, and looked at them from our perspective, one of the challenges that we currently have in our office and in the Sergeant at Arms current office so this, if you consider moving either one of, or both of those offices, we have a, a large number of alarm panels in there. Uh, we have fire panels in each room, security panels in each room, a lot of electronics that while they can be moved, I suspect they will be um, expensive to move and in some cases fairly difficult to move. Um, I, do, I don't think that we would have a problem with that uh, shared space in the, in the coat room with the sergeant at arms office. We often occupy a chair in Janet's office anyway, especially out of session. So I don't think that's a, that's a heavy lift uh, for us. If our current space is become shared with IT, which I believe is one of the options in there to expand the copy room, I think we would still maintain a, a desk in there. We would, the majority of our equipment would go out, but we would probably still maintain the desk in there just to monitor those alarm panels. You need the copy room? In our current office, if that were to expand to be in the copy room. Kevin and I have talked fairly extensively about you know sharing that space to increase the security in the copy room as well to make it less, give it a forward-facing public person, but make it less come in and self-service. Um, as it is now, let him talk more about that. But I think we could still maintain a, a small presence in there to monitor those alarms. Your um, total space needs, which we were talking about earlier, for instance, people needing to decompress, do whatever is necessary. I don't envision that being in this building anymore. I, I don't either, Senator. As a matter of fact, the space uh, study in there specifically references that we probably should be out of the building. And that meets operational needs. You don't want to have all your eggs in one basket from an emergency services standpoint. If something does go very wrong, you would like to have someone immediately in from, from outside. That is uh, kind of the, the approach we've taken to it, is we, we recognize that there's not the space here to do anything. So if we concentrated on getting you space outside of this building, leaving you a chair in the present room where you've got the ability to monitor equipment, is that so I think that meets our, our needs, yes, sir. We're, um, our systems are fairly easily movable with the exception of that fire system, but again, I think we would end up leaving an officer in a chair somewhere by one of those panels anyway. Uh, that's what we typically do now year round. We have uh, some uh, special modifications to the fire alarm system here that uh, I'll be happy to go into off the record, but uh, we, we need to maintain some body in that area. Um, okay. Out of preference, if, uh, if I may, something that keeps us centralized between the pavilion, the Supreme Court, and here um, is the best place for us. Um, I know we had approached BGS a while back about a space that was coming available in that area and the, the renovation, the 109-111 renovation was preempting that, was preempting <clears throat> us being able to get that. I, I think that, I don't have security on that, 
As long as they still have a presence in here, they can have their main office outside. Yeah, but wouldn't you want all your officers here? <coughs> Why? They're not ever all here at the same time unless there's a bad lockdown, right? But you would be maintaining <laughs> pedestrian... That's not the right word. You would be maintaining foot traffic patrols throughout the building. And say we are doing that. that. And they got their station up in the card room, and they've got the room down by the lounge. They you would wouldn't notice any change. You wouldn't They're notice any change. Space. Space. And for instance, the uh, female officer had come in talking about the need for her to drop off kids. We were in front of the Joint Legislative Management Committee. <laughs> and that she is constantly having to be in full uniform because she can't get changed before she gets here, but can be able to have a place to get changed uh, after she drops off her kids so she's not going to the school with a gun, which probably is going to be for both of them. Um, well, the short they're going to take your guns away, too. We would not notice any difference in the actual patrol with this building. No, sir, not at all. And, you know, keep in mind, we do have a mission outside the building. We have a mission to assist BGS in the complex, and we do that uh, fairly regularly as well. So, no, I'm assuming you're talking about the pavilion. Yeah. As far as the... What you were talking about is you would notice some potential available there was. I'm not sure where that space uh, sits now in the, in the grand scheme of things, but we did identify some over there that would meet uh, most all of our needs. Okay. And, and where's the off-site space that you have now in one of the buildings on the? I have an side? office in Six Baldwin. In uh, Six. Yes, sir. And that's on the same. That's in the same spot with uh, with BGS Security. So it is. Um, a, a, a good spot to have. We, we can so can how have many it. buildings down from the main BGS office is we're, that one? So we're down uh, Baldwin Street. You know where uh, the Hopkins Street comes down? It's the building right across from that. So it's the first building down on the left. Okay. The one where the Defender General and... Mm -hmm. the Defender is. General. That's four slash six. That's six Baldwin, yes, sir. Okay. Who's office? One officer? Just, sure. just fine, yes, sir. And you know, with with all the things that we're we're working through, you know, our <sighs> our operations plan looked about this thick for state to state and budget. And, you know, you have to have a place to, to go and work on those things. So, how big is the BGS portion of that? You talking about in Six Baldwin? Yep. It's uh, what half that floor? And half the floor below it? Uh, yeah, we have a, a locker room down <coughs> so, Perfect, locker room all set up. There you go. Um, the space that we kind of eyeballed over there, quite frankly, we did eyeball some space in that building as well. Um, uh, and the risk management folks in AOA and the Ethics Commission currently occupied. The space we looked at over here was unoccupied at the time. Did I hear noise that the ethics commission was going to be eliminated? No more ethics. <laughs> well, in any event, if uh, Senators Hooker, Lyons, and myself don't get these chairs replaced, we'll throw BGS and Sergeant Arms off campus somewhere. <laughs> I don't know. I put in the request, but they never see the institutions committee. They don't have as much pull as us. <laughs> I would just note as, as we were going through the uh, the individual options and option A, they mentioned uh, cameras for the sergeant in arms office. Um, I don't think that's a big lift. The bigger lift is modifying our policy to allow it. Um, the um, under option B, it turns the lounge into a large meeting space, and I would um, suggest you examine the security concerns with that based on what's hanging on the walls uh, of that building for, if, yes. for no other reason. Um, you know, option C is still, the code room still remains an issue. Um, and you know, option D is the one that messes with the cafeteria. I encourage you at some point, if you come back to this, maybe to have the chef from the cafeteria down to visit, because they are absolutely bursting at the seams up there in the show. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, it gets worse. And they weren't, they weren't, uh, it wasn't an oversight of anybody, it just would, you know, nobody really thought about that, I think, in the space assessment. So they probably need to have a chance to talk. So. Appreciate that. 
kids up. If you get back to camp, if you ever get back to talking about cameras, I'll tell you the building's wired for them already, and we know about what it would take to. What's well, coming back to cameras? It's a policy. Policy. Oh, right. Right. I thought we did legislators. That. I thought we just yeah. we didn't. They still we didn't. Well, you did cameras at the outside doors facing out. Yeah. Right. The question the is who who would gain access to them or could gain access to them and what could they do with them if they were inside could they be used to eavesdrop and spy on people and that i mean it, it's a big it's a big question i know there's cameras everywhere and people are completely losing their privacy with facial recognition and if somebody if the wrong person can get into those systems and start accessing conversations that people think are private and so that's one of the concerns we are probably going to talk more about that on the new upcoming joint <coughs> legislative management committee which is currently in a bill in the house um, okay is that anything else we need to uh, thank you um, thank you man. i'm here for a while if you need me thank you, sir um, let's see. We had this guy named Star. Um, I'm not sure. Sure. If, if we here. Oh, look at that. If we let Senator Star come up, we can just finish this conversation. He has a really good, inexpensive plan. Go have we, have we told him yet, though, about his, his, his vote earlier in the uh, yeah. Yeah. week? Uh, 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 perhaps uh, we're not going to listen to right. him now? <laughs> I wish you'd get your witness at chairs, good touches. The chair can't even get my witness. I can't even You should have told me I brought my chair over. I want to thank you for uh, asking me in. And you know, when this, this was all put together last year, uh, there was never any idea. I don't know how much this thing cost you guys or us, but it it must have been uh, kind of a serious number. And uh, and I, but I still don't know how much you you want to spend or don't want to spend. But Santa Maz has said we got to do this reasonable. So uh, I, I took your document home and I actually read the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And well, at least one of us is a real guys. <laughs> and uh, well, if, if you had to sit where I sit every morning, uh, uh, you'd be interested uh, uh, in reading uh, this as well. Uh, but anyhow, uh, I see you had a cross through. I think it's B, diagram B, or whoever had this before their clerk gave it to me. Yes. So I figured B was off the table anyhow. So basically for our concerns here in the, in the Senate, we had uh, first floor diagram A and first floor diagram C. Uh, there is it's page uh, 15 and 17. Yep. So uh, I already had heard that uh, the sergeant Rams didn't care to move from, um, her yes. office. Uh, didn't care. So that would mean that if you did do that and moved to room 10, it was going to mess up the coat room and the mail room. And then over on the left hand side of, of A, you got the coffee room was going to get altered. And then you were going to take the lounge and mess that up. So I said, well, hell, it doesn't take a whole lot of thinking to figure this mess out. Just take the lounge and go down by the door where the door goes into the education room. 
Well, to the left is the door that goes in the lounge. You could put a wall across there. You could put a movable partition, a sliding partition across there. And then uh, some committee would use that room during the session. And it, in your report, it states how the lounge is under, underutilized. It's not used to its potential. And then you could leave the sergeant arms where it is. You could leave Everybody room 10 where right mm -hmm. it is. You could use room 10 in the summer for the gift shop. And the only thing uh, is we've got, we've got one little corner in that back corner of the lounge uh, where Let's maybe it's the IT or yeah. legislative councils yeah. in mm -hmm. Well, I don't know about IT, but they should have their own office. Well, but he but has to be help there to desk. help. Yeah. He helps people with IT problems in the lounge, but he could he, he could have a little desk side. right back up here in this corner. He don't take much room. Yeah, but that would be the only disturbance. Mm -hmm. I don't know what you think. The, the truth, the truth, well, but he needs well, to be there because he helps people all the time, especially on payday and stuff. He's running around from one desk to the other. He could be right there. But the truth of the matter the table in the middle. The truth of the matter is, as Senator Starr said, that space is underutilized. There's all this big open space and that big table in the middle. We could build little workstations that actually have little little privacy petition and you could put 10 times the number of works bases in that lounge even after you took out his, a room for a committee. I think it's a great idea and it's the most reasonable financially you could do this cheap. In a short term. Well, because we're going the, to need more the other thing that I should mention is I agree. I don't we pay for it. I don't get around to visit all the Senate committees <coughs> very often. Uh, but if there's a committee that's already busier than what my room is and needs space because they're cramped, wicked bad. They could do the lounge room. Ag doesn't need a great big room. You know, if you can get eight people, ten people in there, I'm fine. Mm -hmm. I don't need a room for 20. Yeah, but that one has a fireplace. Mm -hmm. Don't you want a fireplace? Uh, the drawback, Bobby, that. to your suggestion, which I do understand, I think it's is that that room is the former Supreme Court room. And historically, if you're trying to keep this building semi-intact, you're going to run into a historical problem. But you could put up a petition, you could put up a petition, either permanent or a folding wall, that does not harm the integrity of the building. It would be fairly simple. That way, if we get to a place where we do an expansion, you take it out and reclaim it, no harm, no foul. And I've been here in the summer. People can't go in that right, room. Right. It, it's roped off. They don't go in the winter either. And uh, right. But Ever. you know, I just, I just. I, I, I will only Joseph say, I personally, morning. every morning at 7 a.m. That's exactly where you'll find. But well, Joe, there's room in that room. As is, look at all the, that open the in the center. middle. It's on under the lights. So if we've got BGS in the room. We can have a chat about the. Significance well, of a historical impact. I, I want to know if Senator Starr's is going to get nineteen thousand dollars for his proposal, <laughs> like we paid the consult. Is that all? Nineteen grand. If you going, if you got all this for nineteen, you did get a good deal because I've had architects work for me, and that wasn't. They usually don't stop with uh, just a few figures. Uh, well, I, I offer that as a, a solution, and, and you know the Supreme Court's been gone from there a long, long, long time. And if we don't want to, if we as a legislature, um, you know, don't want to spending money to add on a new place 
and we want to try to get by with what we've got in a workable situation. We, we, I mean, I don't know how you could do it any cheaper and more convenient. And if you know the walls would be open, if you had a movable partition that could be open all summer and people could look in there and like they do. Yeah, like they do. As, a, as an alternate thought, um, theoretically, you could do exactly the same thing in the coat room. But you're going to be short. But then you don't have yeah. a coat room. Then you don't have a coat room. Right. Mm -hmm. right. So part of the idea about eliminating the coat room was that legislators could technically hang their coats in their own committee rooms. Right. That's one potential. It, it works fine. Well. I mean, I was over in the house for 20 odd years. It works excellent here. But I, you don't want to walk all through the building with a heavy coat on and finally get to the third floor if you make it with a heavy coat and then hang it. And then, well, or, or then for the public to be crammed in, like in, in natural resources and Senator Stark's committees, the same way we've seen it in here. You got 20 people crammed into a tiny committee room and they're all hanging on to their coat now because there's no place to And then there are put coats it. on the wall. Yeah, I will only, like I will only like say that cold. earlier we heard that there is an ongoing problem in the coat mm -hmm. for right. security purposes. Don't leave cash in your pocket. People who are having things disappear. Where? In the coat room. Now, well, maybe we need a camera there. But there are other alternatives. Let me just ask you this. And I know Janet's going to hang me, but I've got to ask the question. If you were to move into Janet's current room, this is the Sergeant in Arms office, does that committee room meet your needs? Definitely, because basically that room and, and the judiciary room are basically, okay. if you look at it, they're basically the same size. Except that has some built-ins to make it smaller. Yeah, well, that would be. Historic um, cabinets. Uh, historic cabinets. Yeah, I've got a historic cabinet at home. I keep telling my wife that. You can't take those. Like that. And, and, uh, and I, 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 I saw her. I saw her. <laughs> That's a deal. <laughs> the camera missed. Uh, no, that, that uh, room would, uh, would work well for a committee room, but, uh, you know, I. I feel that the Sergeant Barnes uh, likes that office and it, it does serve the needs of, of that job and, and, uh, and why disrupt everybody when you can do one little thing for a few hundred or a few thousand dollars and it would satisfy our needs as senators and it would keep the, the building very functional and uh, so anyway that's my two cents. That much of it. Okay. You see the sign up front? You left the sign up front for you that says not agriculture. <laughs> Um, two, four, so, six, seven. So while yeah, you know, I, here. I I had basically six to ten a day down there. You ought to just oh, take your here. crew and this crew and go down. You sit, you sit at the end of the table, and when you get up to leave the room, six people have to get up and move and get out of the if, room so you can get out. If it was. Just a little bit bigger. Uh, but you know, as far as for the committee to do its work, it's a good spot, it's quiet, you don't get, you know, much noise and uh, but it's it's the guests that come, the witnesses that come that it's kind of embarrassing on us mm -hmm. to put them in that Situation. Bobby, and, tell me again, where if you were to have that portion of the current legislative lounge, you want to be in the back where the fireplace yeah. is. Mm -hmm. Where would you actually have the door coming into that room? Door is there. Right. right. Door. 
the door. That door, door down by the education room there. is already a it's door already there. there. Go like this. And you could. And that's the simple way. Right there. You could make that room smaller, but if you put a movable uh, wall in there, you probably want it straight across. Yep. You know. Well, that was one of the. Your problems with the coat room too. Chief, if we put a wall. camera in the coat room after all the initial squawking got over that had no audio, just a video camera in the coat room, do you suppose that would help the theft issue? Not the specific one I was telling you about. Okay. Are there theft issues in the coat room? Or have you not really had much trouble in here? Yeah, I mean, I don't, it's really not been a problem. That's yours. But it hasn't been too bad. Oh, it's Bobby's. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. That's Thank sure. you. I had to go down to education. Uh, we determined we don't need a mail room. We figured that out. We don't need a mail room. They would love to pass out the mail room the way it should be. But if we don't have to mess with that, oh, we just leave it. Yeah, it's just the fog. We don't yep. need a mail room. Well, maybe, I don't know, you want the idea. somebody down there. Well, it's not an easy task that you have before you, but I think it's a solvable, I, you can solve it. I agree with Senator Starr that that's the simplest one that anybody's come up with yet, mm -hmm. and, it, and we can make it function very easily without yeah, spending yeah, a lot of money. You can get by the historic preservation. Mm -hmm. Eric can do that. Well, well he's on vacation. Maybe you should wait till he's on vacation. If you were changing the design of the room or, you know, going to rip something all apart. The, the fireplace. But I so if you had a beautiful fireplace, you'd have the nicest uh, three room in the building. Yeah, I, we wouldn't I, have to give it to him. Institutions my, could get it. It could be That's somebody true. else's. We could move institutions yeah. in there. He's and been the wanting this room. Yeah, we <laughs> like this trip. Yeah. And the radon left for the floor. I thought <laughs> just on on Mondays, I'd have all the committee members climb in there, bring, you know, Board in there, Trump. <laughs> and then we could have our own heat during the week. As long as they don't bring it from out of state. <laughs> All right, thank you. Yeah, right. right. yeah. thank you. Uh, Janet's here. What? Yeah, she did. She's about to take so. the chair, so I guess we're going to hear it. All righty, they go. Yeah, I didn't know you wanted me to, so I would wait. I'm sorry. I just wanted to. No, we'll so. Janet Miller, Sergeant in Arms. <laughs> Before <laughs> Senator Starr leaves, I just want you to consider one thing. I think that when the architects were here, we were talking a little bit about that, and I think you should just check with them. That ceiling is really high in the legislative lounge, mm -hmm. also. So if the partition would have to go all the way to the ceiling, or would it be too much noise just to have a rate? You might check the cost of that, because mm -hmm. I think it could be a lot. And I don't know, do you remember any conversations? Once you're there? putting up a petition, the height Pretty isn't, quiet. the height really isn't the cost yeah. factor. Oh, it really so isn't in construction. That. No, I mean, to add another couple feet, it's This was done. suggested in here, using part of that. It's why the why the 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 Yeah. Okay. True. Yeah. I, yeah. so. I just consider the, yeah. that there the might cost. be more of a cost than you might yeah. think. That's yeah. it. Right. Right. I keep hearing about expenditures, but you know, I come back taking what's in the coat room now out <sighs> doesn't cost us anything. And I know that that means you're using your room in the front. That doesn't cost us anything either. Uh, putting up a wall. It's going to cost something, and if you put up the wall and you're trying to wrestle with historic preservation at the same time, that might be a whole other issue. But well, cross that bridge when you get there. It's a better we're space for. We've got two options to go keep being around. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. Bunch of yeah. Yeah. That's all. Yeah. Did you want to say anything else? No, I don't the, dare. I love, she, she I love doesn't. Senator Stark. Yeah, she doesn't <laughs> dare because she still gets her room. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. I just think that the sergeant at arms is kind of the face of the state house, especially yeah. in the summer. Oh, should be very should be no, that's, that's central. I think they need to stay there. Yeah. But I like this. I like that yeah. space down in the lounge. Way better for well, committee space yeah. than this one here. Yeah. No, until we try. Let's right. try it. 
Yeah. Eric, Eric, you can't answer any of that question right now. Can you? Yes, sure. I, I could relay some of the sentiments I've heard over time because I know I wandered through that room, Eric Phil from BGS. I wandered through that room myself and, and considered, well, if we had a wall here, that would equal a room and that would be a functional. Um, I know that the curatorial staff and others went to great lengths to take down walls in the 70s and 80s. Room 10 used to be divided. Um, Times so change. That's changed. Change. Times change. Yeah, and I can tell the curatorial staff will move them if they are hard to get along with. Mm. They're in my building. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to go on Barry. I heard there's some nice office space in Barry. <laughs> um, that might Kevin, be space. you sort of fit into this picture because this one plant has IT in the uh, coat room too. And if we follow through what's being suggested here, all the coat room stays the exact same way it is now. Um, you guys need to move from where you is. Um, so, uh, Kevin Moore, uh, director of IT. Um, Alright. Just to make sure I'm on the same plan. Are you talking any particular plan here, or are you talking just the partition? Has well, we're looking. I'm looking at the diagram A, and we have a proposal to modify some, to some extent by putting a wall up in the legislative plan. Right. But if we are leaving the coat room the way it is, mm -hmm. you're not going to be able to move into that place. Correct. Um, so it would be uh, challenging for legislators that are in the lunch lounge that you rely on that support for accession uh, to find somebody. There'd still be room for it. If yeah. there's room, then we are more than happy to adjust. Uh, we are incredibly flexible. He just needs a space. That person needs a space to be uh, so they're accessible. That, that's it. Um, uh, our ideal situation uh, was to be just outside of the lounge uh, and uh, where you can see the extended coffee room uh, in diagram A. Yeah. That would also be a help desk location, not just coffee room, mm -hmm. uh, where we would actually uh, uh, recover some space in Ledge Council's current main office as well as the, uh, the thought process behind that. Uh, so we would uh, currently, we occupy a space in the lunch council, we occupy the coffee room, and we occupy a small desk in the lounge itself. If you lump all of those together in the uh, orange location uh, that is identified as coffee room, uh, they would fit there. It would be an accessible location to anybody in the lounge. It's at the bottom of the stairs. And again, you recover those other locations. You do have the possibility of using that purple space called the meeting where Bobby is currently located. Right, the ag room mm -hmm. is going to be open. Mm -hmm. Yeah. OK, anybody else want to chip in? Well, so one more sentiment about that. So, in my perspective, the whole legislative lounge is big and spacious and not um, efficiently laid out or used. We could go in there and build actual little workstations and put in more computers than there are there currently, even after you cut Senator Starr's space out, and leave IT a nice corner office in there because they do provide tons of support for legislators so I don't want to see them outside of that and then if they need more space I think Senator Starr's current committee room is the perfect space it's big enough for a couple people in a, in a couple of desks and you're right there conveniently located good we'll keep kicking it around anybody else oh, that sounds good Thank you. Motion to adjourn? So move. So, so yeah. move. Thank you all for coming.